Right, you're on camera. This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Mr. Ronnie Rondom on Friday, March 27th at 1500 hours. We're located in the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we talk about your experiences in Vietnam, I'd like to get a little biographic information about you. Sure. How old were you when you went to Vietnam? I was uh, 22 on my first tour. Oh, old man. I was. Yeah. Uh, what was your family status? When I went to Vietnam on my first tour, I was married and uh, had one child. In your hometown? I enlisted from uh, Union, New Jersey, was where my parents lived at the time. Uh, however, I'd uh, just finished high school in Manchester, New Hampshire. All right. What was your sense of the Vietnam War before you decided to enter the military? I really didn't have much of a sense of it uh, at all, except for the fact that I was, uh, as an enlisted, I was transferred from Fort Bliss to Fort Rucker, and at Fort Rucker I was part of the, if you will, the aviation buildup. I was in support of the aviation buildup at Fort Rucker. As an enlisted man? Yes, I was. Uh, you enlisted, was the draft breathing down your neck, or no. you just wanted in? I uh, didn't know for sure what I wanted to do out of high school. My parents really couldn't afford college, etc. So I looked at the military as a good option. Uh, I, I thought I was enlisting to, enlisting to be in the um, ASA, and uh, when I went back down to raise my right hand, the recruiter said, you can't do that, son. I said, why? He said, because you're an alien and you can't go in the ASA. So he gave me about 10 minutes to go through the, all the MOSs in front of me on the table and say, pick one. And what did you choose? Uh, uh, 91 Bravo is what it became, 9-11. Medic, basic medic. Cool. Uh, you were an alien? I was. Born, Ex explain that. Born and raised in uh, Oslo, Norway. Emigrated and, with my parents at the age, my age at the time was about 12 when I emigrated. Did you come here speaking English? Or no. You had to learn it. Uh, when I came over here, I knew two sentences. Uh, one was, uh, good night. The other one was, just just one moment, please. <laughs> uh, when you signed on to become a medic, what was the training? Give me a run-through of all your training. I went through basic at uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Um, advanced individual training was uh, medical training at uh, Fort Sam Houston. And uh, th then was uh, finished that and uh, transferred to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas and I was assigned to the 6th of the 62nd Missile Battalion, Hawk, and we were supposed to deploy to Germany. I'd been in the unit a little bit over a month when the personnel warrant officer called me down and said, uh, Rondam, you can't be here. Same thing. I was an alien. I couldn't qualify to go. So I ended up staying at uh, Fort Bliss uh, in the medical de dental detachment and um, stayed there for a little bit over a year then transferred to Fort Rucker uh, for the buildup up there and uh, left the Army at uh, Fort Rucker. You left the Army? I you did. finished up there? I finished my three years. Re-enlisted? No, uh, well I did eventually. Uh, I got out um, uh, for the purpose of going to college. I applied to the two uh, colleges I was aware of in uh, my parents home state, New Jersey. Got accepted to both. Didn't know how to get uh, all the financial aid that I should have but uh, I ended up starting at Rutgers, and I stayed there uh, not a full semester, ran into some uh, academic problems, uh, not really problems, but challenges, and the fact that I was uh, 21 and could go out partying, and none of my classmates could, <laughs> so uh, I decided uh, maybe I wasn't quite ready for Rutgers, so they weren't quite ready for me, and uh, then I re-enlisted. And I, I re-enlisted for the purpose of going to OCS, and uh, of course, the recruiter said, you can't do that. Um, you have to go, uh, stay in long enough to get a recommendation. And so I, uh, uh, when I re-enlisted, you know, I did the traditional Army uh, dream sheet, and I asked for uh, Fitzsimmons General Hospital, 
Letterman General Hospital in Fort MacArthur, California. And they sent me to Puerto Rico. <laughs> the typical army. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I stayed there approximately uh, a little bit over nine months uh, before uh, I uh, went to OCS. On the Medic uh, o, uh, MOS still? Yes, I still have Medic MOS. I worked at the Armed Forces Examining and Induction Station. And uh, eventually you got your recommendation to yep. OCS. And the, the uh, captain who was in charge of that at the time was a man named Dale Bergston. And uh, that was sort of fortuitous because uh, when I got to, uh, got to Vietnam, he was the S-4 of the, the battalion that was sort of our sister battalion in the 25th. And uh, he was able to sort of get me a few extra bunks and a few other things uh, up to me. And I just ran into him by chance when I was there. And in between tours, he was, we were also stationed together at Fort Carson. He was in the sister battalion there. So I got, got to see him at least three times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when, when were you assigned to go to Vietnam? Uh, I was assigned out of OCS to uh, the 196 Light Infantry Brigade. And that was at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And the uh, unit rings a bell with your cohort, uh, Mark, because I was assigned to 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry, uh, which uh, he served in at uh, Fort Lewis in uh, 9th Division. And uh, we were, went through training. That was a train and train unit where uh, they came straight out of a reception station and w was assigned to the 196. And they put them through. Uh, basic AIT, et cetera, and I joined them after they had completed AIT at Fort Evans, and shortly thereafter we went to uh, Camp Drum, New York, now Fort Drum, and uh, completed our unit training up there. And we were scheduled to go to the Dominican Republic to replace the uh, 3rd Brigade of the 82nd that was assigned to the Dominican Republic. This is 66. Six. And, uh, our uh, brigade commander, um, uh, Frank Conaty, um, he went down to um, arrange for the handover with the 82nd. And on his way back, he was diverted uh, to DA, at which time they gave him a change in mission. And that was on June 15th. And instead of Dom Rep, we went to Vietnam. And our, it was fairly interesting in that our unit training at uh, Camp Drum included about uh, uh, half a foot to a foot of snow, and that was on the 8th of May. And so we, we trained to go to Vietnam in a foot of snow. <laughs> and and I, uh, we were also structured more for the Dominican, Dominican Republic. As an example, in uh, uh, the uh, platoon that I assumed command of or in charge of was the uh, Anna Tank Platoon, which uh, 106 uh, millimeter reco recoilless rifles. Not a lot of use for those in Vietnam, but they were perfectly suited for uh, urban warfare in Dominican Republic. Bomb rep, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, we, we changed mission. The unit as such uh, left Fort Devens on the 15th of July and shipped out of Boston uh, by boat, longest boat deployment in U.S. Army history, 30 days. Um, I was uh, spared that. I was on the rear detachment slash advance party. So I left on the, uh, I think it was 8th of September, got there on the 9th of September. But I also ended up going home on 8th of September, and they all went home on 15th July, even though they spent a month at sea. <laughs> so, so that sort of came back to bite me. But anyway, uh, enjoyed it. Um, the, uh, served with some real fine people in the, but, uh, the company and the battalion. Uh, after OCS, you you went infantry. Yes, I was infantry in OCS, <clears throat> and and to a platoon leader's job. Right. Tell me about your first arrival in Vietnam. What were your impressions? It was a very interesting arrival. We we came in on um, 141s, C141 uh, planes, and um, went from Massachusetts to Alaska, uh, Elmendorf to. Uh, um, I think it was Yokota in Japan, and then to uh, 
Tainan, uh, to Tainan, to Tansan Ut. And at Tansan Ut, we got there too late to go on to Tainan that day, but uh, so we had to stay someplace overnight. And they uh, took many of us to a place called Camp Red Ball. And uh, one of the interesting things about Camp Red Ball is it was also used as a storage depot for, amongst other things, uh, coffins. Aye. And uh, many of the, the guys in, that I came over with on that advance party slept in the coffins that first night. Whoa. I did not. I chose not to. <laughs> you used the floor, huh? Uh, whatever I had available, <laughs> not the coffins. And the, the next day we uh, flew from there in um, either one uh, C-130s or C-123s to Tainan. And in uh, my, my first, um, if you will, response when, I, when we landed at Tansanut was the heat of the sort of hitting us in the face as we walked off, which was similar really to flying into Puerto Rico, into San Juan. You had the same thing down there. But it, it was still a, uh, uh, one of those that when you're not used to it, it sort of hits you. It hits you yeah, after yeah. a foot of snow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, while we're here, let's pause and tell me about your second tour, when that was. Uh, I, I went from, the first tour was from uh, August 66 to August 67, and the uh, uh, se second tour went from uh, eight to December 69. And what was your rank by then? Captain. Captain. Mm -hmm. And what was your assignment? Initially a, a battalion admin officer, battalion S1, and uh, after about four months I, I changed to a company commander. What unit? Uh, 2nd Battalion, 506 Infantry. Division? 101st Air Airborne. 101st Division, yeah. Airborne. That, by the way, is the same unit that uh, ended up being the Band of Brothers unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, uh, not, not only the battalion, but my company. You're because going from the 196th LIB to the 101. Right. That's a jump, too. Yeah, yes. But if you look at the old uh, regimental setup, you know, Alpha through a hotel or whatever, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie would be 1st Battalion, Delta Echo, et cetera, would be 2nd Battalion. So the 2nd Company of 2nd Battalion would be Bravo Company. And uh, that's what the uh, Band of Brothers Company was, was e Echo Company. So yeah. Bravo and Echo, and that's the company I commanded in Vietnam. Uh, <clears throat> once you got to uh, Tay Ninh, uh, tell me what your initial duties were. We were responsible for getting the uh, base camp uh, uh, settled, so to speak, for the uh, main body to come in. We were protected by uh, uh, one of the Wolfhound battalions from the uh, 25th Division, uh, either 1st or 2nd or the 27th Infantry. And uh, th uh, they were mechanized and they sort of uh, had the perimeter around the base camp. And it was our job to sort of clear the uh, internal area. Uh, the main thing that we ran across was uh, tapioca and anthills. And the anthills would be about as high as his room. And we started with such mundane things as trying to shovel them, et cetera. Then we found out that C4 and, uh, worked a lot better. <laughs> and you know, we, we'd dig a hole into the mound and then insert uh, a fair amount of C4 and yell fire in the hole. Blow termites. And, and, and run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> What what was the daily routine like? When we, How long were you building the base? Well, the uh, the rest of the group came in. Um, what about nine days after eight nine days after we got there, and once they came in, then we I, I had my platoon back, and I was responsible for um, getting my platoon area uh, set up and running. And we had. Uh, GP medians, which later became what was referred to as a web talk, which was a, a wooden um, a tent kind of setup with a, um, a canvas cover on top of it. Right. So we had to get all those put together and, and you know, we, we put those together ourselves. So we didn't have engineers going around doing that stuff. That was the platoon that did that. And then we were also, we did not come with all the equipment that you would normally think you would have in Vietnam. Uh, as an example, we didn't uh, have such things as cots, we didn't have uh, jungle fatigues, we didn't have uh, jungle boots, uh, we didn't have uh, the 
uh, what we refer to as boonie hats, etc. None of that was there. So we were you expected to steal it? Uh, not sure, but uh, that's where my affiliation with uh, Captain Bergston from my uh, time in Puerto Rico came in handy. <laughs> he helped us some. And we also, uh, in my platoon, I had a, a young man, uh, Sergeant Sousa, and Sergeant Sousa was affectionate, affectionately known as Charlie the Grasshopper. <laughs> and the, he became the Command Sergeant Major's favorite scrounger. Ah, uh, yes. He would give him, uh, initially he gave him two deuce and a halves and told him to go to a, a long bin and bring something back. He didn't specify what. Just something. And he didn't have anything to trade with when he left. Somehow or other he managed to uh, acquire things to trade with and acquire things to bring back. And uh, we never asked him how or why. <laughs> you know, he, he just brought it. You know, it's, uh, those who have been around the military knows knows what midnight. We know how those things is. work. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Once you were settled in and had all the things working, mm -hmm. uh, what was your routine? We, uh, because of the structure of the, uh, my platoon, uh, our primary mission became uh, perimeter defense for the brigade base camp, and uh, so I had uh, my uh, one and six millimeter recoilless rifles spread out around our battalion sector, if you, you will. You still had those things? Oh, yes. I still had them. And uh, then um, uh, they figured they need to find something else for, for us to do. So that we had uh, at least two missions where we, we went out and protected uh, uh, fire bases of, uh, uh, I think, one was a 155 battery, and, uh, uh, and that's the, the uh, artillery mounted piece that's on tracks. And then uh, the other one, I think we had a 105 millimeter battery that we protected once also. And Did they ever let you trade in the 105s? Uh, not while for, I still had the uh, platoon. Later on they did. Let you trade them in for machine guns? Uh, it was for various things. They, they retained, I think it was four um, uh, recoilless rifles Jeep mounted. Uh, per battalion later on, but that was after I had uh, was given the mission to take my platoon and uh, train them to be infantry, if you will. Yeah. And I went through about a month and a half to two month training of that uh, before they were declared infantry ready, so to speak. And where most of the uh, people who had been in a combat uh, platoon leader or company commander position, they would rotate into a, a little bit more um, logistic or administrative position after six months, uh, I got to, to transfer also to, an, to a, be, be a rifle platoon leader. Be in the, yeah, to yeah. finally be able yeah. to command a rifle platoon. Yes, I, I changed to an, another company and became a rifle platoon leader. All right. So I, I was a platoon leader for a year. All right. Uh, what responsibilities consume most of your time, both the in camp and then later when you were a platoon leader, rifle? As, as uh, and a tank platoon leader, you know, same thing as you do any time as platoon leader. You check on your, on your troops, you check on their position, you check on their fields of fire, and, uh, you, and most of the time we were in def defensive positions uh, and a tank platoon. Um, and then when, when I trained them to become uh, a infantry platoon, then it was taking them out and teaching them how to do patrolling and ambush uh, sites and uh, setting up like that. Yeah. Uh, what were your impressions of the Vietnamese civilians, uh, if you had much contact with them? We had a lot of contact with them on that, uh, while we were in Tainan. Nan. Tay Nan's a fairly uh, good-sized city, and uh, our company commander was a man named Art Lorca, who was fluent in French. And uh, we would go into town with him, and he would translate, and he would speak uh, with everybody in town. We would stop and talk with people. Uh, a lot of interaction between us and the uh, local populace. What were your What were your thoughts about the Vietnamese? Where they seem to be good people. They seem to be people that uh, there was reason for us to be there to. Uh, if you will protect them or fight on their behalf or whatever. 
but but that that was my feeling then. It may have changed a little bit later. Yeah. yeah. Describe your friendships with and your impressions of your fellow soldiers. As a platoon leader, uh, you get to, or you, if you don't, you should get to know uh, who they are, where they're from, who their girlfriend or wives uh, are, what their names are, if they're, their family, or what their status did uh, was before they came in the army, etc. And uh, that became a sort of relationship I had. and. Uh, I still keep in touch with many of them, both from as platoon leader and as company commander. So I feel pretty blessed by having had that relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you form friendships with men from different racial or social backgrounds during your time in Vietnam that you might not have had in civilian life? Yes, but not just from Vietnam. I had that before. I, uh, well, I was enlisted, and uh, bef uh, before I went to officer candidate school, it wasn't something that just happened because we were in Vietnam. Right. It's uh, the to me it was normal camaraderie, uh, but in any, any army unit. Right. Uh, what did you do for recreation, off-duty activities, if you had any off-duty? I uh, didn't really have, have any off-duty in, uh, in Tainan. Uh, you know, I went on uh, R&R two times, um, went to Saigon to visit uh, troops uh, two or three times, and that was at the behest of our bat uh, battalion commander. He would uh, sort of push that, that the senior and COs and officers, the way to, for them to relieve stress was to go and visit troops that had, uh, were hospitalized. In the hospital, yeah. Mm -hmm. So these would be visiting your troops? Uh, or anyone from in the brigade yeah. that were there. Do you have any specific memories of the popular culture of that time? Music, books, films? On, on my first tour, uh, I, I don't re don't really have any great memory of it uh, and as to what we did or didn't do. Uh, at that time, if you will, my, my uh, uh, life was basically army and I didn't really pay that much attention to what was going on outside. Yeah. Now, uh, describe for me your area of operations where you served. Uh, the first... Um, Eight months, uh, seven and a half months, we were in, which is War Zone C, which is uh, uh, northwest of Saigon, and uh, involved in f some fairly large operations. Um, uh, Operation Adelboro was the first one that the brigade was involved in. Uh, then we were in, involved in um, uh, uh, Cedar Falls, yeah. and Junction City. Yeah. That's uh, ones that come to mind. We Those also, are all really big ones. And we also were responsible for guarding the uh, quote-unquote combat jump of the 173rd. Oh, yeah. And you know, when they, <laughs> they jumped in and got their bronze star for having jumped in combat, <laughs> and their drop zone was, uh, I guess, uh, you, you could say secured by uh, three brigades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's well, some combat jump, huh? Yeah, the 173rd always gets a little... Huffy when we bring that up. <laughs> they get a little huffy if you bring that up. Oh, uh, yes, oh, yes. Uh, can you describe significant actions, uh, combat operations in which you participated? The Attleboro, Junction City, that, the, whatever big battles you saw. Okay. In, in Attleboro, uh, I listened rather than participated. Uh, we were, uh, at that point, I still had my Anna tank platoon, and we were um, securing a 155 battery uh, next door to a civilian irregular defense group training area, uh, CIDG, which yeah. was, uh, uh, they were trained by special forces uh, officers and NCOs. And um, uh, they, uh, one, one of my uh, cohorts over there, a, uh, first lieutenant, he called and said, uh, hey, I think there's something big going on. You want to come listen? So I 
went over to their talk and listened to the uh, beginning of the battle and a good part of it. Uh, when that first started, the, the, the initial thing that we heard on the radio was that uh, another Special Forces trained unit, uh, referred to as Mike Force, uh, was being uh, opposed by the, I think it was the 272nd uh, Viet Cong Regiment. And uh, the, the Viet Cong Regiment was coming through uh, Mike Force in order to go and se secure their a, a large a cash area. Mm. And uh, they basically ran right through the Mike Force unit. And the next unit that they came in contact with was uh, uh, my battalion, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry. And so I, I listened to a lot of that going on. I did not participate. It was probably uh, uh, 15 to 20 kilometers or more from where I was located. And uh, Junction City? We, we had some, my first actual uh, time of being shot at, I was still at the anti-tank platoon leader and they had a uh, attack against uh, many of the base camps simultaneously, primarily mortars and uh, uh, light probing, probing attacks, but we were shot at then and uh, I think my, uh, my anti-tank platoon recorded his first uh, uh, um, if you will, a combat casualty uh, on their side, not ours. And when sh uh, one of my gunners, a young man named Bill Blaha from Chicago, uh, shot his uh, 106 rifle without using a spotter round that you're supposed to use when you, you shoot a spotter round first to see where, where the target is, see if you're hitting it right, and then you shoot your main gun. Well, he just shot his main gun, and he when it landed, you saw uh, sparks going every which way, and this was almost at max, maximum range of the weapon. <laughs> it was a fantastic shot. Great shot. Yeah. And then um, uh, later when I became the um, uh, rifle platoon leader in C Company, uh, I experienced my first, if you will, uh, somewhat close com combat. Uh, uh, we were going through a um, uh, jungle area and all of Tainan is basically flat, except for Nui Baden Mountain, Black Virgin Mountain, yeah. which sort of reminds me of Stone Mountain. You know, it lo looks like uh, God sort of came out there and would, here's a mountain, and dropped it in the middle of the plains. And, but we were out there in a flat area going through there, and uh, we were going across a fairly open area uh, towards a wood line, and we did uh, what we refer to as uh, a reconnaissance by fire going into the wood line where almost everybody that's on line will fire their weapon into that wood line and uh, no response. So we, we kept going and then we got, we got uh, a hit, uh, I'd say within oh, uh, maybe 50 meters of the wood line by a, a fairly large fusillade uh, coming towards us. And uh, the first person who was hit was a sergeant uh, uh, walking right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And to me, I know that that bullet was meant for me. As he was a, if you will, a stateside, stateside strack looking soldier where you know, everything in his right place, uh, the uniform just right, everything. So he, he just looked like he ought to be the leader. Uh, well, I did not. And I was behind him. The only, th only big difference was that uh, the radio telephone operator was behind me, not behind him. And uh, so, th uh, but the, the first bullet fired uh, hit him in the chest. Mm. And uh, he, f he fell, and uh, after we got some, uh, started returning fire fairly heavily, I, I crawled up and pulled him back, and he basically died in my arms. Ah. Uh. Uh. Tell me about your second tour. Now you came over as a company commander? I came over as a battalion admin officer, ah. administrative officer. Okay. And uh, stayed in that position for about four months and then became company commander. Tell me about that experience as a company commander. That was, uh, uh, I, I started off with battalion commander that was um, more from the administrative side than the combat side, and he was probably not the ideal person to put in that position, but I guess he'd earned it. 
And uh, so he was a little difficult to work for in that sense. Um, he thought he supported us very well, but I didn't think he did quite as much as he should. Uh, uh, this was during the time of uh, Hamburger Hill, which uh, one of our companies was involved in. Uh, my unit sat on top of a fire base called Firebase Airborne that overlooked um, the Ashaw Valley and Hamburger Hill. And uh, we saw a lot of things from there. We didn't see, couldn't see individually what was going on. But uh, we, we heard also there, heard all the after action reports. Was started. that fire base overrun during the battle? Not during that battle. It, it was at an early t uh, t time before, uh, before my company that. came in there, yes. Uh, What's the biggest combat operations you were on as a company commander? Uh, I had a, a very difficult mission for uh, probably six weeks plus. And uh, I, it started out by walking out of uh, Firebase Airborne, and we went uh, uphill, if you will, and each side of the Asha Valley was over a mile high. So it's fairly good, good sized hills. And we walked up one side of the mountain. We spent uh, one evening up there close to uh, um, e Eagle's Nest, uh, which was a small, it wasn't even a fire base, it was smaller than that. But uh, that was the only time I was in Vietnam when we were sleeted on. Uh, we were in, we had jungle fatigues and no field jackets, and it was sleet. And we froze our rears off. <laughs> I'd say, say other things, but I'll go over here. Uh, <laughs> and um, then we went from there, we walked back down the mountain, and uh, was just about, uh, we were just about in the valley, and we received orders to uh, um, go on an uh, air assault, helicopter air assault, to the other side of the valley. And we landed on that side of the valley uh, late in the evening, uh, just barely uh, at, uh, it, was, it was starting at uh, dark, it was uh, dusk. Uh, so the, in my mind, the operation went way too late in the day. We came in, then uh, had to sort of feel our way into uh, finding a, uh, an, a nightly defensive position, NDP, and we, we found a place, and it was apparently uh, a previously uh, dug-in uh, North Vietnamese Army base or area, so they knew where all the holes were, and we, got, we were attacked that, night, that evening. And then the mission that I had from then on was going and um, uh, clearing land for landing zones in the jungle. So we would uh, basically move maybe five kilometers and uh, do one, move another five kilometers, do another. Now in the jungle, you don't clear um, landing zones uh, with machetes. It's big trees. It's teak most of the time. And we started out by using chainsaws that were flown out to us and lowered. A uh, chainsaw would stay sharp for maybe five minutes before it would need to be, uh, the chain needed to be replaced. Uh, so we knew that wasn't going to get us anywhere. So we went to the same thing that I learned on my first tour, C4 and debt cord. It uh, works a heck of a lot faster and you learn how to um, emplace it so the trees would fall the right, right way but you don't do that quietly. So they knew where we were all the time, the uh, North Vietnamese or Viet Cong, whomever was in the area. And uh, I started out, uh, when, I, when I went on that uh, um, airlift, the combat assault, I had approximately 130 people in my company. Uh, after six or seven weeks, I had uh, 40 some odd. Now, they, they weren't all casualties. You had people that went on R&R, &R, uh, uh, was scheduled to go home and left. Uh, I had people who uh, got malaria, uh, broke their leg, whatever else. But it was still, uh, the combat strength basically made me combat ineffective as a company. And uh, I ended up asking to be relieved and be brought back because I did not have enough uh, soldiers to really pull off the mission that they wanted me to do. You asked yep. for the company to be relieved. Yep. Yep. Did they agree? Yes. After the second or third time I asked. Yeah. 
So that, that was not a, a great mission. And uh, during that time, I had several uh, uh, contacts of where I, I lost people and several that were a little bit scary. What's your most vivid memory of your time in Vietnam? Uh, going through the jungles. And on my first tour, one of my most memorable had nothing to do with combat, although we were out in, I think it was in Junction City. Uh, in th that part of the area of, um, in um, Warzone Sea, you would have red ants that would curl up inside leaves, and the leaves would sort of form like this, with the uh, bottom being the, the area that would open. And if you brushed up against that, it would, they would open up. And they would fall down on whomever brushed up against them. And when you do that, uh, back then Junction City and Cedar Falls both were multi-divisional operations where you basically walked in line through the jungle and tried to uh, push the uh, North Vietnamese or uh, Viet Cong to a stopping force. And what we were supposedly looking for at that time was uh, referred to as COSVIN, which was the uh, um, Viet Cong headquarters right. in South Vietnam. We never did find them, never did do any good, but uh, the numbers of times that the whole line would have to stop, and uh, you're talking about, like I said, a divisional or more line, because these ants dropped down, and in order to clear that, you had to t completely strip and have somebody pull the ants off you wherever they were, and the same thing on all the clothing that you had on before you could put them back on. Yeah. And that's a definitely a memorable <laughs> observation. Yeah, I'd reason. say. Right. Um, also, on my second tour, uh, more combat-oriented, uh, 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 one night when uh, we got probed pretty hard, and uh, I was, uh, I, I did not have an artillery forward observer. I had a, uh, his sergeant was there, but uh, uh, the forward observer, the FO, was not there. So I became my own forward observer, and um, uh, I had a battery, uh, artillery battery, firing for me that I had quite a bit of experience with, and I trusted him quite a bit. And this was a, a 155 battery, and they, I ended up bringing them in around my perimeter the, most of the night. Uh, as close as uh, 50 meters from uh, my location, or from the perimeter location. And doing that all night, uh, that, that made for a challenge. Yeah, I should mm -hmm. say. And, but I will say that that night I did not lose anybody. And uh, we found blood trails the next morning, but no bodies. Describe for me the best day you had during your Vietnam tours, either one. Um, jumping on the freedom bird and going home. There it is. There you go. Tell me what that was like, going home. When I left or when I arrived? When you were leaving. On my first tour, uh, if, if you remember, I said I arrived uh, almost a month before the rest of the brigade. And uh, I, the company commander that uh, was in charge until the end, he left on time. So the new company commander that came in, uh, he now had uh, basically four brand new lieutenants and me. So he did not want me to go. Normally, you have uh, the uh, term that we use was a turtle. When you when you come in uh, and replace somebody, that's your turtle that comes in. So uh, my turtle came in. And uh, I didn't have a job, and he wouldn't let me go. So uh, I spent almost a month um, having a good time. Uh, the, one of the units we got to know quite well was the helicopter unit that supported us both in Tain Nguyen and moved up to Chu Lai with us the last four months. And they were, had their uh, location out uh, close to the beach. And they had a very nice uh, club out there, and I had absolutely no reason to stay in my platoon area when I could go out there and, re and relax. Yeah. And so went from there 
to um, uh, Cameron Bay, is where, when it, where I left out of a, on that tour, and uh, leaving Cameron Bay and watching the people water ski in the bay as you take off on the plane. That's a little different. A little different, you know, yeah. We didn't have too many water skiing. Uh, no, my, I had a school chum of mine who yeah. spent a full tour in Vietnam teaching sailing at the Cameron oh, yeah. Bay R&R oh, yeah. &R Center. I I've, I've know a guy who taught golf. <laughs> what did you do in the war, Daddy? <laughs> what did you do during the war, Daddy? <laughs> uh, how much contact did you have with family back home? A letter writing. Letter writing. Mm -hmm. How much news did you receive, if any, about the war from home? Very little from home. More, more of uh, what, what I saw was uh, Stars and Stripes, reading Stars and Stripes. Were you aware of the political and social events and movements going on back in the States? On my second tour, yes. I'd, I'd, I was not so much aware of my first tour, yeah. although I was quickly made aware of it when I landed in uh, Travis Air Force Base and went through San Francisco. What was that experience like? Not good. Not good. No. I, I was one, one of the people who were, were spit upon going through San Francisco. You really yeah. were? Yeah, I was. I've seen people mm -hmm. say, claim that it didn't happen. Oh, yeah, it did. Oh, it did. Yeah. Uh, I was with. Uh, two friends who sort of grabbed a hold of me and said, let's go, let's keep going. However, I, uh, my return on the, on the second tour was probably, uh, affected me more. When we landed at McCord Air Force Base, uh, coming back on the second tour, before we could leave the airplane, a, a sergeant came on board and he said, gentlemen, I highly recommend that before you leave the McCord Air Force Base, you change into civilian clothes. Do not wear your uniform. And I, that, that probably hit me worse. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Describe for me the worst day you had during your Vietnam tours, either one of them. On, on my uh, second tour as company commander, when uh, during one of our uh, landing zone clearing areas. So we got hit uh, uh, fairly early in the morning. I ended up losing, I think, six men. Killed or? Six yeah. men killed. That was not a good day. Not a good day. Not a good day. How much, if any, contact did you have with our allies, the Koreans, the Aussies, the Ties the Filipinos. On first tour, uh, co-located at uh, Tainan, we had the Philippine Civic Action Group, and I got to know several of the uh, officers in there. One officer uh, became so friendly that when I was going to go on R and R, he wanted me to go to the Philippines and st stay at his house with his wife, <laughs> and I turned him down. <laughs> and uh, but uh, all very very nice people. We. Uh, they would take the San Miguel glass beer bottles and cut them to make them into uh, drinking glasses. Right. And we, we all had many of those. <laughs> and uh, th that was most of what I saw in my first tour. In my second tour, I worked with the uh, uh, Vietnamese Army, uh, the Ar Arvin uh, First Division, uh, and uh, th the unit that I worked with was a mechanized unit. And they were, they were good. They were good. Yes, they were good. First Division uh, had a good reputation. Yeah, yeah. and also uh, I learned how uh, when, when you lose communication, when you're on a, uh, tra when you're a track commander on a Army personnel carrier, you, know, you have your driver in front of you and you stand behind him in an open hatch. And the way you, the, uh, uh, the radios very seldom worked on those. So the way the track commander would get him to go to one side or the other would be to take his um, uh, stick or whatever he had and hit him on one sh side or the other, you know, the shoulder. <laughs> uh, and if he didn't do it hard enough, uh, didn't do it uh, quickly enough, uh, 
uh, he would get hit several times by the, a larger stick if necessary. Uh, their, their method of uh, command and control was a little different than ours. <laughs> And I also work with Marines. So. Oh, there's a, there's a different force. It is. <laughs> the, we we got to ride on their um, uh, Amtrak's, the the uh, amphibious tracks. Yeah. Uh, they don't all swim. Not very well. No. The yeah. freeboard on there is very short too. Yeah. And well, we, we learn real quickly when we were about to uh, cross a small body of water, and this is on my first tour in July, uh, where the uh, Marine track commander said, uh, do not go get inside, stay on top. Stay on top. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was one of the tra tracks in, that we had there that uh, uh, the, tr the driver and the track commander left after we did, because it, the track was going downhill and we were going, didn't want to go quite as steep as they wanted. <laughs> How much contact did you have with family back home? I would receive letters from my wife and every once in a while letters from my parents, but not a constant thing. Did you receive any news about the war from home? No, not really. Nothing? Mm -hmm. Aware of any particular political or social events or movements not, back not, home? Not on my first tour at all. Yeah. On the, on the second tour, it was more from Stars and Stripes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I can interject something, on my first tour, I, I read a book that, uh, you know, we got books in uh, what they call the uh, PX kits, kit boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I received one that was uh, basically the history of Vietnam. And uh, that gave me a lot of insight into the rest of my tour then and more towards the second tour. This basically went back to the 17th century or something, and uh, qu quite in depth. Uh, it was probably uh, four or five hundred pages, and that was my reading material when we'd stop for, uh, and, and rest anywhere. And uh, it was a book that uh, I think many of our senior officers would have benefited from having read back then. Do you know who wrote it? No, I don't. Yeah. How much contact have you had with your fellow veterans over the years? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You go to reunions? I do. Yeah. How, well, how, however, I, I prefer the, the smaller unit size uh, reuni reunions to the divisional size. Yeah. Uh, as the probably the favorite one I went to was uh, um, initiated by one of my sergeants in my second tour. And we had it in a state park in Tennessee, and all of us served to, had served together in the same company, and there were about 20 of us there, and um, uh, there was a big sign at the park when you entered, uh, no alcohol allowed, and the organizer uh, had gone to the office and explained what we were doing and who we were, and he said, as long as you all don't race a ruckus, we don't care what you do. <laughs> so. The, they had to haul, haul away quite a bit of, uh, quite a few cases, <laughs> empty ones. Did you have any difficulty readjusting to life after the war? No, I did not. Did you stay in the Army? I did. For how long? Uh, I stayed until I got caught in a reduction in force in uh, 1972, and I got out, and then uh, I, uh, in order to, to um, qualify for in-state tuition in Texas. I joined the National Guard there, and then I transferred to Rhode Island, and I joined the reserves there, and then I came back to Texas, but uh, stayed out of any active in, uh, involvement for about two years. Then I went back in, into the reserves, and uh, stayed in reserves from basically 1977 until I retired in 96. Wow. And, th and during that time, was recalled for Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Ah. But, uh, and that ties into, you know, uh, what you're asking about uh, uh, how I uh, got home and did I have any issues, et cetera. 
I think one of the most helpful things for any veteran returning from uh, combat is to uh, have people around him who have gone through the same thing that he or she has and be able to discuss that. If you haven't been there, you don't understand it. I don't care what people say, uh, you just don't, you, you just don't get it. Can't get it. No, not quite. Is there any memory or experience from your service in Vietnam that has stayed with you through the years and had a lasting influence on your life? It's really not much different than the Army in general. You know, be mission-oriented. Um, know who you are. Know what you can and can't do. And uh, I think the Army teaches you that, but so does life in a sense. <clears throat> Did your experience in Vietnam affect the way you think about veterans returning from combat today? Very much so. How so? Because the way we, we were treated when we came home, um, we worked uh, very hard, uh, especially through the uh, Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association, in uh, greeting soldiers when they come to the airport, about uh, uh, inviting more soldiers to be a part of us. We've tried to help um, uh, the Afghan and uh, uh, Iraq veterans start up their own. Uh, I've befriended several at that level um, and have uh, helped them through the same kind of uh, issues. And, uh, I'm, I'm part of a, I've, I just received approval for a 501c3 status for uh, a group called the uh, uh, Markers for Mil Milton Veterans, Incorporated, who was initiated by one of our AVBBA members, who's also a councilman for the city of Milton. Out of his own pocket, he builds crosses, or markers, we're not allowed to refer to them as crosses, uh, build markers uh, for anyone who is, has, was deceased from the city of Milton or uh, relatives of anyone who lives in the city of Milton, and he p uh, has put those out every year. And he started that in, I want to say, 2006 or 2007. And he is now up to over 400 of those that we, and we put them out just before Memorial Day and just before Veterans Day. They mm -hmm. stay up for about 20 days. And um, when uh, my wife, uh, deceased wife, passed away, and she was a, uh, also retired as a full colonel, but no active duty whatsoever, uh, I asked if him if we could have a cross made for her. He said, certainly. Can I help? Yes. So uh, over there helping him do, uh, do that cross, uh, I asked, uh, and his name is Bill Lusk, and I said, Bill, uh, uh, you've been doing this on your own? He said, yes. I said, how much money have you spent on that? Well, I don't know, about five, six hundred dollars a year. And I said, uh, how would you feel if we tried to put together a charitable organization? He said, probably be okay. And I did it for two reasons. Uh, one, to uh, take a burden off him, but second, he's a city councilman. Uh, how would that be viewed uh, as a city entity, a separation of church, state, whatever? Yeah. And um, uh, I've gone through a, a lot of, uh, what should I say, uh, putting it off, uh, et cetera, for about two years, but finally got approval uh, a week ago. Got it. That done. is now a 501c3. C and one of the uh, people that's on my board is a uh, Af Afghan veteran, Marine. And uh, I have a, a female on the board and not service connected. And I have a uh, Navy man on the board. And I have the mayor of Milton on the board. And uh, it's not going to be a tremendously uh, big funded organization. We don't think we need that much money. But it is something that I'm very happy to have accomplished so that we can take that and if some future city councilman or whatever decide that uh, this is not something that the city uh, should be involved in, the city doesn't have anything to do with it anymore. <coughs> so we sort of removed that completely from the uh, political arena. How do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today, or is it? And, uh, 
very little. Uh, it's what we have uh, have done in the ABBBA. We put up a, or erected a, a <coughs> memorial every year for the past uh, 28 years or so, with the last one being last year. And uh, that was one that uh, I was actually in charge of because it was done in the city of Milton. But uh, we've had so much tr uh, difficulty in uh, uh, raising funds for that and getting uh, public involvement in it, we have now changed that to uh, uh, use our, uh, any funding that we have to support uh, veterans attending Perimeter College and other such things. Also being very involved with Atlanta History Center. Did you take away from Vietnam more that was positive and useful than you invested in blood, sweat, and tears? I would have to say yes. I did. In the end, what did that war mean to you and your generation? That we, we ought to be proud of who we are and who we were. What lessons did you take from Vietnam that you would like to pass on to future generations of Americans? Study history and study it well because history will repeat itself. Have you visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? Yes, I have. What are your impressions when you go there? Sadness for the number of people, names that are on that wall, many of who, who served with me or for me or both. Have you heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War Commemoration Project? Yes, I have. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I'm wondering if anybody cares other than those who served. Well, they're the ones we're saying thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and welcome home. Mm -hmm. Late, but better late than never. I agree. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Romden. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming down and doing this. Uh, Thank you. Welcome mm -hmm. home.